Master Series. This is Maddox Casey and Say Evans. We're back with you again tonight. And first of all, we want to thank Southern Medical Association, Southern Medical Services, Warren Averett CPAs and Advisors, and Jefferson County Medical Society, uh, all of our sponsors for our summer series. So for tonight, our topic is going to be detecting employee embezzlement and uh, it, we will make it short and sweet tonight uh, because we have some do's and some don'ts to give you <laughs> to protect all of your money. That's right. So to this point, we've gotten you to reduce your cost, you've increased your revenues, so you're, you're making as much money as you possibly can, but you don't, you don't want to work this hard and then have your money just walk out the door because an employee is stealing from you and you don't know it and you weren't in a position to learn about it until three or four or five years later or you may never know if you're not watching this. You may retire one day and never know that an employee stole a million, million dollars from your practice. That's true. And, and, we, and we've got story after story of practices that didn't catch a theft that going on for a number of years um, and we have stories where they've caught it pretty quickly because they had controls in place to catch this stuff. But healthcare especially the medical practice, is in a very unique situation for an employee to steal from you because you have typically have a relatively small staff compared to many businesses, so you're not able to separate the duties for a lot of employees where you, know, you may have someone handling cash and that's all they do and they don't reconcile the bank statement. Um, you may not have that ability in your, in your practice. Um, so healthcare is unique because you have employees doing a number of different things, wearing a number of different hats, which oftentimes presents an opportunity for theft. So today we want to talk about things you can do to help reduce your risk because there's nothing you can do. There's no magic bullet and say, you know, uh, you're never going to have a theft in your practice if you do this. That's not going to happen. We're, we're about reducing and minimizing that risk. Um, I read a stat recently that said 80% or over 80% of medical practices will experience a theft of some type within a five-year period. Um, and I imagine you want to be in that 20% that doesn't experience that theft. And if you want to be in that 20%, you're going to have to take some action. You're not going to sit back and just cross your fingers and hope, my, I, you know, I trust my employees. A lot of times an employee that, that steals is the most trusted employee because no one's looking over their shoulder to see what, what's going on. And that's something that you can do um, is just creating the perception that someone is watching can, can go miles and miles in, in reducing employee theft. Yeah, so we've got a rowdy crowd here tonight. We've got uh, standing room only in the <laughs> conference room. So if you couldn't make it live, I apologize. And I think the last count that we had on the webinar were we got about 75 people viewing tonight. So if uh, you're one of those people and you have some questions tonight, um, please email us. Uh, here is our email addresses on the screen currently. And of course, there's our phone number, but if you call that right now, you're not gonna get us. So uh, you can call that at a later time if you have questions about the webinar, seminar, any of the other previous seminars, uh, here's our information. So I'll give you just a second to pull out your uh, pen and prescription pad and start writing these down. All right. All right, well that's pretty easy and straightforward. So let's back up here a little bit and start with... Um, let's just hit some of the key people that have the opportunity to steal in a practice. So obviously you have your managers and your bookkeepers. They're the people that have control over your, your practice management systems, over your bank statements. They may have online access to your bank statement or your, or your bank account. Uh, the managers and bookkeepers are the key people in your practice. As I mentioned before, they're often the most trusted people in your practice, and uh, they have multiple opportunities to, um, to steal from your practice. You have the insurance staff that are oftentimes posting uh, payments, posting uh, insurance payments or writing off payments, uh, making adjustments to, to, your, um, to your payments. So they have a unique uh, opportunity to steal and steal in some very creative ways. We saw one practice where uh, someone in their, their uh, insurance staff was running patient refunds to a personal credit card. So in the system, it looked as if they were refunding a, uh, 
a patient for an overpayment, and, but in fact, they were routing the credit card, routing the payments to their credit card. And this went undetected for a period of time until the uh, credit card company called and said, hey, what's going on here? We keep seeing uh, credits going to this credit card. This doesn't make sense. So um, that's just a one very unique and uh, creative way a, a person was stealing in that situation. Uh, nurses often have the opportunity to steal, can also, you know, often have access to drugs and other things that they could steal from a practice. Um, you know, typically you don't think of patients having the ability to steal, but depending on your practice and the, you know, what you have in your, in your patient rooms, they can steal anything that's not bolted to the floor. Um, there may be samples in the room, there may be some kind of equipment that may be valuable. Um, you know, you just need to keep an eye on where things are and, and have someone check room every time a patient's there to make sure nothing's missing. Uh, drug reps often have uh, the ability to keep samples or to take or swap samples for something else that may be in the, in the sample closet. Um, so that they have an opportunity there to do something like that. And then, you know, you have a cleaning crew that's in at night. You need to just make sure that things that are valuable, you're not leaving a cash drawer open, you're not leaving anything that the cleaning crew could get their hands on. Um, and another type of theft is time, and that's one that's very difficult to measure, very difficult to, to put a dollar value on, because it, you, it's oftentimes hard to quantify that or even realize that it's going on. It, you know, with the access of phones to Facebook, to Farmville, to all the games that they can play on their phone, uh, it's ridiculous the amount of time that can be wasted doing things like that. Yeah, I mean, clocking in, clocking out, if you still use that procedure, uh, you know, getting somebody to clock them in before they actually get there, uh, those are dollars that add up over time. We talked earlier about overtime and coming in 30 minutes early, but just kind of, you know, heating up your breakfast, lounging around, not really doing any work. I mean, these are technically, uh, you know, thieving you of your time right then. So it's, it's, it's a valuable subject to look at. Say mentioned the type of uh, titles that would steal from you, but they're roaming all around your office. Uh, anybody has the ability to steal from you, and what kind of person actually commits fraud? They're, the old fraud triangle, if you've never heard of it, it's the, somebody with financial pressures. So not, the, not having the ability to pay something, or they've been in medical trouble, or they've got a, a grandson at home that they're trying to support, or their husband was laid off. Those are the type of flags you need to be looking for. Those type of people are more likely to steal from you. It's one with opportunity, one that uh, thinks they won't get caught. What type of opportunity is that? Well, there's a lot of opportunities. Say, mentioned the, the refund, someone who's controlling uh, too many aspects of your internal controls. And we're going to mention uh, how to you know, guard yourself against those whenever you, whenever you have somebody who has a lot of opportunity. The smaller the practice, the more likely someone's wearing a lot of hats. Someone's doing posting of the payments and also receiving the money. Just because you can't hire enough people, we can't segregate the duties out. So financial pressures and opportunities. And then lastly, rationalization. That's usually when someone steals from you, I deserve it. Um, you know, you're a physician making two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars and I'm working just as hard as you are and you're paying me twenty five, thirty, thirty five thousand dollars. I deserve that money, I'm working just as hard. So when those three come together, and if they're all three there with financial pressure, opportunity, and they can rationalize it, that's your perfect fraud. Uh, that's, your, that's your suspect. Um, and say mention managers and bookkeepers, and those are of, oftentimes beloved employees of, uh, of physicians because they've been with them since they started, or they've been there for 15 or 20 years. And those, in our experience, are the ones that have the most opportunity, the ones that actually rationalize it, and they rationalize it because they know what kind of money you, you make. They may be one of the only few people in the practice that know you make half a million dollars, so they know that uh, they have large incomes and, and also um, they have the opportunity. So when you put those two couple together, they are the ones that are most likely to steal from you. And uh, those are the ones you usually love the most. So you gotta watch out for those ones you love the most, right? Say, is that a song right. somewhere from the 70s? <laughs> I figured you might know it. I think you're thinking of love the one you're with. Oh, but okay. hey, it sounds like it could be a good song. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of times it starts small. It will be, I'm just going to borrow $10 from the petty cash or the change bucket or whatever it is. And that $10 is borrowed but never gets paid back. You know, it doesn't get paid back in three weeks. 
and that employee notices nobody, you know, nobody said anything to me about that, um, and they still have that pressure, maybe somebody's sick in their family, or maybe their husband or wife lost their job, so they take another $20 the next time, and it builds and builds, uh, and they just take more frequently, and it can be, begin as a pretty innocent, um, benign thing, but if nobody notices and, and there's no controls in place, a small theft of $10 can build over a period of three years to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah, that's exactly right. And some other facts here, you know, a young person may be more likely to steal, but a person over 40 is more likely to steal a larger amount of money. Um, a male is more likely to steal than a female. And this is kind of staggering here, but 87% had no prior record of theft. And more than half of the people were, were in counting jobs or upper management. Now, those are just some facts to think about when you're, when you're thinking about how do I control this aspect. Some other things you should look at and think about is someone uh, that has low job satisfaction. They're not very happy. Uh, that gives them, you know, rationalization or even um, the financial pressures. Uh, the, you know, their cost of employee misconduct is underestimated. So we don't really know what's going on. It's underestimated. The relationship between property and, you know, production deviance. So looking at uh, those two relationships, and then a younger employee, like I mentioned, is more likely to still. So we, we have to take all this into consideration before we begin to put our thresholds into place because you may not be able to put every internal control advice into what we have tonight but put it into practice, but you may want to think about where is my biggest uh, gap, where is my biggest hole as you move forward, and what, 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 who's, who's look around at your staff and, and figure that out. Um, some flags, and these are just some, some flags of what you should be looking for, someone living beyond their means. So if they show up in a uh, you know, 2010 Lamborghini and you're paying them about $14 an hour, we, 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 you may want to look into that person. Uh, there's some, something's not, not going quite well. I just read an article recently about a group went in to do an audit of a practice or just check, check on the practice, do an assessment, see how things are going. The first thing they noticed when they drove up, there's a Jaguar in the driveway or in the, in the parking lot and they found out that was the office manager that was paid uh, a salary far below what you would expect to be able to purchase that car. And they also found out that that office manager's husband had also lost his job a year ago. So living off one income that was not that great, driving a car that was very expensive. And in the period of a week when they were there, the office manager didn't show up after day two, day three, they had resigned and then through the work they figured out that that employee had been stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars from the practice. Yep, that's right. You know, control issues and addiction. So if you've got a, you know, someone who's addicted to gambling, well, we, we, it's a pretty red flag that you need to look into what's going on with that. Uh, just minor control issues could be a problem. Uh, recently divorced. They could have lost a lot of their income in that divorce or had to uh, pay up money due to a divorce. If they refuse to take vacations, that's a telltale sign of something going on because they know if they take a vacation, then we mentioned this earlier, that their whole scheme or plot may be figured out. So oftentimes they only take one or two days off at a time. That, that allows them to continue to do what they're doing and not pile up too much. So we recommend, and we noticed, we said this earlier, to at least take a week of vacation. Uh, that lets everything kind of come to fruition and things start to fall out and uh, the fraud usually figured out if that's the case. And a lot of times, it's an employee that appears to be the hardest worker. And they're working so hard because they got to cover their tracks. So if you have an employee, they may be a hard worker. I'd love to give everyone the benefit of the doubt. But if they're working hard, always working overtime, taking work home, and never taking any time off, that may be an employee you want to say, hey, you need to take a week off and see what happens. Maybe bring in someone to see just to do, you know, kick the tires and see what's going on because a lot of the times the employee that's working the hardest seems stressed out. Maybe your best employee is working that hard to cover their tracks of what they've been stealing. Good point, great point. Uh, you know, other things, complaining about inadequate compensation, so you don't pay me enough money. That's, that's a telltale sign. Uh, unusually close relationship with a particular vendor. And that's a, that's, a, that's a neat one because what we'll see is, and we don't see as much as we used to, but a vendor has an uh, office manager might have a lot of control over where we're buying uh, our products, our medical supplies. You know, we're, we're getting the best price is what they tell you. 
But what you don't know is that that vendor knows they're making that decision, and that vendor, uh, this is part of theft, that vendor is providing them a full stocked uh, uh, house with a bar at a lake, you know, <laughs> twice, twice a year. Or they give them their beach condo for, you know, two weeks just for using that vendor. And we may not be getting the best pricing. So you got to look at those vendor attitudes and make sure we're shopping those vendors and make sure you know who your vendors are. Um, and we actually had a case where that, that exact story was happening. They, they were buying from a vendor and they weren't buying them because every, every year they got two weeks at their lake house. Uh, fully stocked bar, by the way, as well. So it was. I was going to say that seemed pretty specific example. Yeah, Must yeah. have happened. Uh, you know, a wheeler dealer attitude. Someone who's always wheeling and dealing. Uh, that that's just another red flag to look for. So those are some things to look for. We gave you the type of people. It can be anybody in your office. We gave you the red flags to look for. The attitudes. The telltale signs um, of what of what's going on. So. Now we're going to jump into, once we know who those people are and we know the telltale signs, what can we do? Because you, you can't figure everything out. You, can, you can't investigate every little circle. What can be done to put at least a firewall, to put a, a barrier around, um, to keep your money inside of your practice? So Yeah, and that's called what we call internal controls. It's just systems and procedures you have in place to minimize the risk to your practice. And the first header under here, the segregation of duties, is what I mentioned before. And in an ideal world, if you had you know, all the staff that you would need, you could ha assign individual duties to each person and everybody would do that job and there wouldn't be a risk of overlap where someone handling cash was also making the deposits. Um, but that's not reality. Uh, reality is you've got a bunch of employees that probably have to do multiple tasks and that, and that creates a risk. Um, we're just going to go through the, you know, through a list and say some things that you should do in your practice, if possible, to uh, to implement some internal controls. Uh, you know, mail should not be opened by the person making deposits or the person maintaining accounts receivable records. Bank statements and canceled checks should be mailed to the physician's home or directly to the accountant to review. We actually had an example there with bank statements. We, we could never, and a lot of times we, you lean on your accountant to make sure fraud's not happening. We can't guarantee fraud's not happening. A lot of these cycles we don't see when we get your accounting records. So we don't detect fraud. Even our audits you know, are even outlined in our management letters that this is not an engagement to detect or identify fraud. Uh, we'll see it a lot, and one of them that we saw was that we could never get the bank statements. They would never send us the cancel. They would never. Not, they would never send us the canceled checks behind the bank statements. Mm -hmm. um, and that this person was committing fraud, and they were actually just writing checks to themselves, and they didn't want to show us that. So yep, that's a pretty brings, easy. brings an example within the last year. There was a practice whose administrator was writing checks to her boyfriend, and she was forging the signature of the of the, the doctor and the doctor never reviewed the bank statement never looked at the canceled checks so that went on for a period of time and no one knew um, all it took was the doctor you know t looking at the bank statements periodically or even giving the impression that they were going to look at the bank statements for that theft to never begin in the first place um, but that's a good point the bank statements are key because all the money goes in or out from the bank statement and if you want to check the pulse of your practice, see how things are looking, see if anything looks strange, that's where you want to start. Now here's, here's one of my favorite examples of bank statement and canceled checks, and I'm not sure that we would even find this if we had to, but um, there was a, a practice owner, a real estate company, and they made real estate checks to the real estate, to their company for rent. Let's just say it was um, Jefferson County, PC. Well. The manager opened up another practice, another entity, and did Jefferson County P dot C dot. So they had two dots in between the P and the C, and that, that legally had a different entity name. So they would begin to write checks and have the physician sign the checks, but the physician didn't notice that there were periods between the P or C or didn't even think anything about the P to C. So they were, in, in essence, thought they were just, you know, it's fine, it's my company, I own that check. They were actually writing checks to an entity that, w that, was in, uh, that the office manager had opened up and was siphoning all the money through. So, mm -hmm. And that falls under the next one, accounting, oh, accounting I jumped, controls. I jumped, I jumped to it, didn't Good I? lead okay. in there. Yeah. Uh, it falls under accounting controls. And the way to avoid that situation from happening is, let's say your 
using QuickBooks or whatever accounting system. You need to set up a control where for anyone to add a new vendor to the system has to have an override or authorization. So there's a password to add a new vendor to the system. So if that doctor had that password, nobody could add a vendor to the system without getting his authorization. He would have known, we already pay rent, why are we adding another um, Jefferson County PC to our system when that's already in there? That would have headed it off before anything started happening. So that's an internal, that's an accounting control that you need to have in place is make sure there's some restriction to who can add vendors in the system. Because a lot of times, as Maddox said, we see where a bookkeeper or another employee has added a vendor that's very similar to an existing vendor and it won't cause any suspicion. So, you know, a part of that accounting control is required that all patients receive a receipt for payments. Um, you've probably seen at a fast food restaurant where they say, let us know if you didn't, you know, receive a receipt for your payment and your meal will be free tonight. That's part of this in, in accounting control. The reason they do that is so that they can record everything that's going in and out of that practice and that the cash, they aren't just receiving free food, uh, in this case, free services and the cash was going straight into someone's pocket. So that's why receipts are part of accounting controls as well. Mm -hmm. You need to keep your petty cash and your change drawer separate, which petty cash is small bills, change that you use to buy small things in the office of nominal amounts. Change drawer is what you use to make change for patients when they pay in cash. The change drawer balance should never change. Let's say if it's $200 at the beginning of the day, end of the day it should be $200. The petty cash may change you know, go up or down depending on if you have to put more money in or not. But if you combine those two, you can be taken advantage of because someone can take more money out of the, out of the, the, uh, the change part of it and then say, oh, well, we had to pay for a chair or whatever it might be. And then you just put more money into that and you, so you can keep the petty cash and the change drawer fully stocked. So that if combining those two just creates a larger pool and a larger ability for someone to take advantage of the practice through stealing that, that money. Yeah, but if you're constantly um, replenishing your petty cash, something may be wrong with that as well. We shouldn't be paying a lot of things out of our petty cash. We should have a nominal amount of money inside of our petty cash account. But if you're deciding you're going to pay, you know, three, four, five, six hundred dollars worth of medical supplies or office supplies, or you're going to have parties out of your petty cash, you're opening yourself up for the ability for people to just take money right off the top and classify it as a, you know, office supplies. You know, we bought some staples today that, you know, nobody knows where they went. And your, you know, your daily cash deposits need to be reconciled with your day sheets. And then the petty cash and the change drawer need to match every day. And one way to check and make sure this is being done is you could throw an extra 20 or $10 or 50 or whatever you want to put in there and see if it gets noticed. And whoever notices it gets to keep it. If they don't notice it, you know that they're not doing their job. I like that idea. Yeah. I like it a lot. You know, what else you should do is compare your current period revenues and your expenses to your prior period. So look at a comparison, month to month, year to date, year to date, and make sure that those numbers are lining up. So if we've spent $10,000 more on office supplies this year, why? Why do we spend it? You know, that's another part of theft. You know, a lot of people, <laughs> we see this happen a lot during the August and September period of time, office supplies go way up. And nobody ever thinks about that. Well, that's because everybody's kids are going back to school in August and September. So all the pens and pencils and erasers and uh, <laughs> you know sheets of paper, they all disappear right around that time period uh, as everybody starts to begin to stock up. And if you can see, I'm doing my hands in parentheticals over here for their school supplies. So looking at those periods and making sure they fall within the reason, a reasonable amount and uh, expenses are, if they're rising, know why they're rising. Yeah, but look at your revenues. You know, if you know you're working the same, working just as hard, and your revenues are down, maybe somebody's taking patient payments at the front desk. Yep. Yep. Uh, don't use a rubber stamp. Don't have a stamp for your signature. That is just a money machine for someone that gets a hold of it. That is a money machine. Stamping their way to millions of dollars, right? Uh, you know, we would tell you to have a, a, one of us, a healthcare accountant, review your financials at least quarterly just to make sure that things are in line. And that quarterly review is invaluable in our opinion. Of course, we're biased there a little bit, but it offers uh, benchmarks. It offers a 
second tier of judgment looking over it, it also scares them. It's a fear factor. Uh, they think that we're scouring over every single penny because we're accountants, and we do scour over a lot of pennies and tie them down and offer that great service, but uh, it also keeps them accountable for someone looking over their shoulder. Mm -hmm. uh, you might also want to think about using an outside payroll service. I mean, if you have someone in your office processing payroll, that could give them the ability to give themselves a bonus. They could also create another employee, add their husband or child or whoever to the payroll, and if you're not monitoring that, you're never going to know. So using an outside payroll service can kind of add an extra set of eyes watching that and can, can bring things to your attention. Yeah, I mean, adding another employee or adding someone else to the list is a very, very common uh, issue with theft. It's just so easy to go set somebody up on the, on the payroll service and just cut little bitty checks to them here or there, and we see that happen all the time. So hopefully the payroll service catches that, but if they, sometimes they don't. You should at least pull once a year, twice a year, your list of people who have been paid for the year, and make sure that you recognize everybody on that list, mm -hmm. that you're actually paying the people that work for you. Yeah, and make, yeah, make sure they work for you. you These may are novel, them. novel ideas. Say, <laughs> so why is with. Maddox a child on my payroll? That's right, that's right. All right, but you as the physician have a huge responsibility in your practice. You set the tone. If you're going to the petty cash or the change drawer and making change for yourself every day, employees are going to think they can do that. That's a big no-no. You're going to set the tone for your practice. So there's things that you need to do to set that tone. Uh, do not give anyone in the practice the authority to sign checks. Um, designate one of the physicians to do that. Um, also, never sign a blank check, no matter how good the excuse is. That's great. You never know where that's going to end up or what's going to happen to it, or if they drop it and somebody finds it. Um, review all credit card statements. You know, that's one opportunity for someone in the practice to spend a lot of money buying things for themselves from Office Max or Sam's Club or wherever it is. Uh, you need to review that and make sure all those purchases are for the practice. Uh, one other thing you can use there to minimize the risk of having someone purchase things from a vendor that shouldn't be purchased from, you know, if you only want your employee buying things from Office Max, you can set uh, by a P card, I believe is what it's called, right. and you can set it to where you, the P card's only good at Office Max or it's only good at Sam's Club or whatever it is that you need it to be good at. And uh, you can also set a limit on that. So if you only want them to be able to buy $300 per week of X, you know, you can set that limit. Whereas if you give them a credit card and free reign to buy whatever they need, you could run into some problems. Um, also, as Maddox already mentioned, you need to have someone review the canceled checks periodically, make sure they're endorsed right, make sure the signature looks correct, make sure the pay is right, um, you know, check all the things that are important on that check to make sure it's really to who, to whom it should be paid to and that someone's not forging your signature. Um, let's see. Looking at all your credit card statements, making sure that's a, another place for fraud. There are no limits on that credit card, and it's hard to pull some of that activity out. Sometimes we'll just get a, hey, this is all medical supplies made on my credit card statement as an expense, and you know we need to see the detail behind that and see what actually is being charged on the credit card itself. Listen to your patients, too. I mean, if someone comes in to see you and they complain about a bill they received, and they say, y'all sent me a bill for for this uh, last month and I already paid that and you know I, I can show you my check or, or my, you know I, I know I gave you the lady at the front th that money that may be a red flag right there hey someone's taking money at the front desk if the patient already says they paid it but we have no record of that in our system that's, so that's something you need to follow up on as the physician also when bad debts are written off in the practice you need to review that you know every week or every month or whatever it is because if someone pays at the front but your staff is recording that, putting it in their pocket, not recording it, and then they write it off at the end of every month or week or whenever it is that bad debts are written off, that's a huge opportunity for them to steal money. So you need to be reviewing that and let them know that you're reviewing that so that that minimizes that risk. Yeah, you know, doing background checks on employees is also another a good idea, making sure that they don't have a past history of criminal activity. And you would not believe how many practices hire people that have a checkered past and, and put them in positions in, yeah. where they have the ability to get their hands on some money. Yeah, so background check is easy, uh, cheap. We run them for our clients. I mean, just it's some of the best due diligence you can do. You also need to buy a fidelity bond, which will cover you if 
theft does occur. It's not going to cover you if you're negligent and you're not paying attention to what's going on, but if you have some internal controls and you're doing your best to minimize that risk, that's when the fidelity bond will come kick in and, and make your practice whole in that situation. You know, and overall, just a big pay attention. Uh, you know, keep an eye on your practice. Just act like you if you're not really doing it, and you're not going over what we just told you to do, at least to act like you're doing it. Acting can be just as effective as actually doing a lot of what Say and I just told you you should be doing from the physician responsibility side. And we hear a lot of stories, and it's happened with a lot of our clients, where we'll come in to do an audit or a checkup, and the employee that was, you know, we didn't know it at the time, and we may not even be in com coming into the practice to look at that, but the employee that was stealing will suddenly just not show up or leave. Um, so it's just the perception that someone's going to come check things can can do a lot of good. Yep, that's right. So we've been through the segregation of duties, the accounting controls, and the physician responsibilities. You know, what do you do now if you think someone is stealing from you? Uh, the first one um, is call a labor attorney. We need to have someone who has some attorney-client privilege, someone who can actually. Uh, you know, put the process in place if someone actually is stealing from you. So you need, you do need to call your attorney if that's happening. And secondly, you need to involve your accountant or a consultant to conduct a true audit of wh where you think the money's going out. And like Say and I mentioned at the beginning, we don't find it all, but we do have a pretty extensive checklist of coming through, especially if you think fraud is happening. We, we know a lot of the little pit holes, a lot of the secret caves, the secret libraries of where people have in the past uh, committed fraud. And we usually seek, try to seek those out and see if uh, some, something's hiding yeah. in there. You need to ask the employee about it. A lot of the times, it's just eating the employee up inside, and they they may get to the point where they just hope they get caught, and they want somebody to know. Um, just asking the employee about it may they may confess to you right there and say, "Yes, this is what I've been doing. I've been doing it for this long. I'm glad you finally caught me because it was just it was too much on my mind to keep keep doing this." Yeah. You know, con contact the authorities. You know, that's the next step. Your attorney should be involved whenever that actually happens, depending on what kind of theft we're talking about. You know, can it be prosecuted? A lot of times that money's been gone and blown is spent, um, and, and there's no repercussions, but um, or, or there's no recoup of that money. But uh, still, we need to conduct your, uh, the talking with your attorney and find out if we need to actually do that. And then expect a threat of repercussions. They have been stealing this money for a long time, uh, potentially and they have been watching to see what you're doing so that whenever it is time for you to you know, confront them, they have every little thing that you've potentially done wrong all in their head and they, they use this as a threat. I had this happen with one of my physicians. Uh, someone was stealing money and then as soon as that happened and it was all figured out, they said, if you report me or you try to go after me, I will tell them all about your illegal yard guys I will tell them about that, you know, this time you actually, you know, submitted a claim where you actually weren't in the room. I mean, they have every little detail that, that has ever gone on ready to fire back at you. So uh, that's one of those things you need to talk to your attorney about. But, but go ahead and expect that that's going to happen. They've been watching if you, you know, for any little thing that you've done wrong. Not that you've done anything, but uh, if there's anything there, they will. That's just another reason to run your practice as squeaky clean as you can. Squeaky clean. You know, don't discuss this with any anyone other than your attorney, partners, and, and a manager. This isn't something that needs to get out and about. And know. don't mention it to another employee because they. A lot of the times, it's collusion where two employees are doing the th the, the theft together. So if you mention it to one, you know, it could create some problems if they're both in it together. Yep. You know, don't don't accuse anyone of stealing before you actually know the facts. You know, don't tell an employee that they are fired because they stole. Uh, those, are not, those are not good practice habits right there. And of course, don't be surprised if the employee denies it completely. Uh, that's, that's a common thing we see. And really, that's it tonight. I wasn't kidding when I said we're going to be short and sweet. We're at 40 minutes. Um, these people in the room look like they're uh, beginning to <laughs> get, a little, get a little tired and uh, that they're hungry and they want some food. But uh, They're about to go look at their bank statements. They're about to go look at their bank statements and begin to do some due diligence. We'll be happy to help you with any of this if you need help on it. Uh, these are the do's and don'ts. I think this presentation uh, will be available soon so that uh, you can have it for yourself and hopefully you wrote down some of the practical tips or a couple 
practical tips from tonight that will keep uh, all the hard-earned money that you deserve and that you've worked hard for, uh, will keep it in your account and not in the hands of a thief. So we appreciate tonight. Again, we appreciate Southern Medical Services, Southern Medical Association, Warren Averett, CPA and Advisors, and Jefferson County Medical Society. I don't believe I have any questions on my phone, say, do you? Let me check. I have zero. No questions. Okay, well then um, we are good to go and we are gonna sign off.